Well, we had our fair share of rivalries and big games over the past several days in college basketball with records being broken, court stormings filling our news feeds, and more chaos in the AP poll and the ACC as well. It is time to break it all down today right here on Locked On Women's Basketball. Ogumba Wallet for the win. You are Locked On Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Cheers, friends. It is Monday, January 22nd, 2024. I hope you are staying safe and warm today wherever you are. And if you are a Ravens Chiefs, 49ers or Lions fans, congratulations, because your teams are still alive to make the 2024 Super Bowl. And I don't know about you, but we all probably need a little bit more Jason Kelsey in our lives. So let's hope for that. I am Missy Heydrich. Welcome to Locked On Women's Basketball. I'm the national correspondent here at The Next. Thank you for making Locked On Women's Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. So post your jobs for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Well, we thought last week was a bit of a storm of craziness when it came to the women's basketball AP top 25 poll. But if there is one thing we should know about college sports and really sports in general, that nothing should surprise us and we should be ready for a little bit of everything. What we have learned is that no spot other than maybe number one is on true solid footing in this top 25. And the ACC is mixing it up with the best of them already in mid-January. We also have a monumental record that has been broken yesterday in Palo Alto, California. To help me break it all down today is Mitchell Northam, one of my fantastic colleagues at The Next, who is not only an AP Top 25 voter, just fabulous as it is, but the man with his finger on the pulse of everything that there is about ACC women's hoops. Mitchell, hello, good morning, and welcome. All right, let's talk about this poll first, because I feel like last week it went just it was like someone turned it upside down and shook it and then you tried to figure out where everybody went. We have to start with the one thing that is the on the most solid footing and that is the unanimous number 1 and that is South Carolina. You yourself as a voter, you see this, you live and breathe it every day. Um there was a point there where it was unanimous, there was a little split, UCLA was getting a little bit bumped, but right now this South Carolina team is just head and shoulders above and it's being proven week in week out in this poll. Yeah, um, I was one of the people, you know, who voted for maybe the only person, I'm not sure, um, who (laughs) voted for UCLA a few weeks ago as number one, just because at that point in the season, I thought that UCLA had played a tougher schedule. um, And really, there wasn't much separating, I thought, you know, South Carolina and UCLA. Since then, UCLA has lost, you know, they they had that loss to USC. um, And South Carolina is still undefeated. um, And, you know, it's hard for me to argue with you know, an undefeated South Carolina team that, that has played a good schedule um, and has started off SEC play, you know, by tearing through the league. They're going to get kind of their, you know, one of their first tests in a while um, this Thursday when they play um, at LSU. So that's going to be, you know, a lot of eyeballs on that game for sure. Um, but yeah, right now, South Carolina is number one and it's hard to argue against it. Sitting there today, this poll just released, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you, it's about 11, 15 um, central time, about 12, 15 Eastern time where Mitchell is. This has just come out for everybody that's looking for today's poll. You've got two teams sitting at two and three from the Pac-12, which and for everybody that's taken notice about how tough this league is, um, you've got to give credit to UCLA and to Colorado for the type of seasons they're putting together. And they seem pretty darn deserving of where they come in this week, at least in this poll, your thoughts about those two teams and maybe the rest of the PAC 12 and how it's sort of maneuvering its way through this top 25. 
Yeah, definitely think, you know, like I said, UCLA had that loss to USC, but it was a really close game and they weren't quite 100 percent. I think Lauren Betts was battling an illness um, in Colorado. I mean, you know, their only losses of the season so far um, to UCLA and NC State. I mean, they they look as good as any other team in the yeah. league. Um, I think if the season ended today, you know, you might have a case where the Pac-12 I, I've made the case that the ACC and the Pac-12 are kind of the two deepest leagues this year. Um, but I think the Pac-12 is certainly better at the top, probably. Yeah. So you might have a case where, you know, come March when the brackets come out, you know, maybe the most, you know, Pac-12 teams hosting, um, you know, maybe, I mean, if you look at the poll right now in the top 16, there's five Pac-12 teams. And, you know, those right. top 16 teams, according to the committee, um, get the host. So I, I think you might have a situation where, you know, we see five Pac-12 teams hosting um, and then maybe nine ACC teams, you know, making into the tournament. So, yeah, I mean, really, really good league there at the top. I mean, it's it's looking like a league where, you know, anybody can beat anybody. I mean, USC kind of just found out this week losing both to Colorado and yeah. Utah. Um, we saw Utah kind of slip up a little bit there, you know, earlier, you know, a couple of weeks ago, but they seem back on, on solid footing. I mean, Alyssa Pili is as good as any player in that league. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, those top five teams are going to, going to duke it out. I, for those that um, maybe missed the memo, didn't see it. Iowa drops an overtime loss on the road at Ohio state. They drop out of that <laughs> upper section, those top few spots in the poll. Ohio state gets a little bit of a bump themselves because it's a big win and a very decisive one for them on their home court. Um, it's interesting because, you know, there's so much made about this Iowa team when they lost that early game to a K-State squad, who we'll talk about in a minute. They lost that game early November. They beat them in the rematch uh, 10 days later when they played in Florida. And then Iowa's been on a tear. But as we know, as in the Pac-12 and in the ACC and in the Big Ten, everybody kind of beats up on each other during conference play because you're in a round-robin setting or you're going to play people multiple times. Maybe your thoughts on that loss by Iowa, what it shows, what it doesn't, and maybe also what it means for this Ohio State squad who's been riding a wave as well. Yeah, I, I kind of thought that um, that result said more about like Ohio State's growth and, and where they are. You know, they they kind of had some tough losses, you know, earlier in the season. They've lost three games so far. But I thought that was really just like a good defensive performance by them as a team. Um, and then Cody McMahon just breaking out and kind of putting the team on her shoulders, especially there in overtime. Um, so, yeah, certainly a really big home win for them. I think I was going to be fine. Um, I think it was another game where, like, you know, Caitlin Clark had her 45, and then you were kind of looking around waiting for somebody to step up. And I was had that at times this season. They've yeah. had different players step up. But in this game in particular, I thought they maybe didn't get what they needed out of the rest of the team all the way. Um, so they're going to be fine. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the top of that Big Ten race, you know, Iowa, Ohio State, Indiana, um, you know, that that's a good league at the top, too. You know, you don't have Maryland playing their best this season, but um, that I think those top three teams, that they could make it interesting kind of coming down the stretch. And I wouldn't be surprised if Iowa lost, you know, another game or two, you know, as we make our way into February and, you know, before we get to the Big Ten tournament. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, because you go back even a few weeks ago and it took a buzzer beater for them to beat Michigan State. And it was, again, another one of those games where Caitlin Clark is going to get hers, but you're kind of waiting and looking that it's the supporting cast. And that ultimately is where that's going to be the performance of those kids in conjunction with what she's able to do, I think, is where they're at their best. They don't get that. Then you run into a buzzsaw at times. All right. Speaking of bud saws, if you had asked me, I don't know, a month and a half ago, start when the season started, if I would have thought that the top ranked team in the AP poll coming from the Big 12 Conference would be Kansas State, I might have said you might be crazy because I wasn't sure what we were going to get from this Kansas State Wildcat squad. But this week they get a win on Saturday. They beat their rival Kansas at home without Ioka Lee. They're 6'6 All-American who is injured. She's going to be out four weeks at least. I would say, um, but they're in at number four and the highest ranked big 12 team uh, right now in this AP poll, your thoughts about the big 12 and this K-State squad and why for someone like you as a voter that they continue to get the nod, even without one of their best players. 
Yeah, um, I got the chance to see uh, Kansas State in person earlier this year at um, the Gulf Coast Showcase where they had their rematch with Iowa and ended up losing that game. It's their only loss of the season so far, um, but I also saw them beat North Carolina there. Um, and I, uh, you know, I had Kansas State in my, you know, top 10 last week and they won by double digits over Kansas. And I just didn't want to punish them, you know, for having yeah. an injury. Um, so, you know, they keep winning. And I mean, I think, you know, if, if you haven't watched this Kansas State team, you might not know that, you know, they are more than just Aoka Lee. Um, they've got some really good guard play, you know, in, in the two Glens and Serena Sundell, um, Gabby Gregory. I mean, just kind of across the board, you know, really disciplined, good guard play. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, they have, uh, I think, a big matchup tonight. Do they yes. play Baylor? Yes. Yeah. So that is certainly going to be a big game that could affect the poll going forward. Um, I mean, Baylor's a team that has a lot of depth in the front court. So we're about to see kind of how they get tested without, you know, Aoka Lee and kind of how they handle um, some really good, you know, front court players. No, you're absolutely right. And that'll be a matchup of number four and number 13. Baylor comes in this week at number 13 in the poll. And I, as you said, I think it's going to be incredibly interesting. I think a lot of games are won in the trenches of the backcourt. But when you have a really, really good front court, that is only an added bonus. Speaking of big time front courts, there's a lot of those in the ACC. And so when we come back, we're going to talk with Mitchell. We're going to talk about the depth of this ACC, what's been going on, what has surprised him so far in these first few weeks of conference play. But first, a message from our friends at LinkedIn. At the start of the new year, every small business owner is asking themselves the same question. What is the one move I can make that will take my business to the next level in 2024? Well, LinkedIn Jobs knows that your success all depends on the team you surround yourself with. That's why LinkedIn Jobs has created the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. It isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. And it's very easy when you have that many qualified candidates. It's so easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus their leading competitors. And they also know that small businesses are wearing so many hats and it might not have the time or the resources to hire. And so thankfully, LinkedIn, the process is intuitive, quick, and it is easy. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. Hi, everybody. I am Missy Heidrich, and thank you for making Locked on Women's Basketball your first listen every day. Lockdown has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Lockdown Sports Today is here for your 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Lockdown Plus, our national shows covering every league. So go to Lockdown Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. Well, here with me today, Mitchell Northam. Mitchell, let's talk about this ACC conference, the one that you see and you live in on a daily basis, my friend. Um, I'm looking at the standings as of games yesterday. You've got three teams with one loss in conference play, and you've got three teams with two losses, and then it becomes a log jam. So let's talk about that upper section of the league, maybe what has surprised you. But you've got Syracuse at 6-1, and one, North Carolina at 6-1, and one, and Louisville at 5-1. and one. What has stood out to you in these first few weeks? Yeah, um, I can't say I'm surprised by um, North Carolina being at the top because I thought when the season started – that they sort of had the roster makeup that was maybe the most equipped to sort of battle Virginia Tech, um, who, you know, won the league last year, went to the Final Four. Um, I just thought that with the additions that Courtney Banghart made into the portal and then with the players coming back, like Deja Kelly and Alyssa Utsby, that they sort of had the, the makings, um, you know, to be a top team in the ACC this year. Now they took their lumps early on. You know, yeah, they, yeah. they had a tough, you know, Golf Coast showcase that I just talked about where – they lost to Kansas State and they lost to Florida Gulf Coast. Um, and, you know, they battled some injuries early on as well. You know, uh, lost to UConn in a game that was, wasn't really close with a tight rotation. Um, they did battle South Carolina really tough at home, but lost that game. Now they've kind of been on a roll here lately. I think they've won eight of their last nine. 
Um, they've gotten healthy somewhat. And I think those new faces, you know, a freshman, Renaya Kelly, and the transfers in Lexi Donarski, Indian Navarre, Maria Gokdang, they're all sort of playing more together now. And the chemistry right. is better. And Deja Kelly has really emerged over these last four games, um, playing the way that she's capable of playing. I think she's had four straight with 23 points or more. Um, and Alyssa Utsby has just been consistent. Um, on both ends of the floor, scoring, rebounding. Yesterday, she had a career high in block shots with seven. Um, earlier this year, she had the program's first ever triple double. Yes. So she just kind of does everything for them. Um, you know, so uh, I'm not super shocked by their sort of ascendance because I, I thought that would be the case. But I am surprised that right there at the top with them is Syracuse. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I I don't think if you told me, you know, at the beginning of the season, you know, Syracuse is going to be in first place mid-January, I wouldn't have believed you. I thought that they had the makings to be, you know, a, a tournament team this year. Um, but they've been playing really, really well. And, yeah, they, they've beaten who, you know, who's been on their schedule. Um, I've seen them twice this year. Unfortunately, both times they lost. I saw them against Maryland and against North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Um those are their two losses. So two maybe losses. a bad luck for the orange. <laughs> um, and, uh, but you know, they played really well. I've gotten to see them on TV a little bit as well. And, and you know, Deasia fair is just playing out of her mind lately in threes in a game last week. Uh, you know, and they've got some other good pieces around her, like, you know, Georgia Woolley and Kyra Wood and Alyssa Latham. Um, so, you know, Felicia Legge Jack really has the orange humming. Um, and, uh, you know, Louisville has been, been strong. Um, I didn't think kind of coming into North Carolina yesterday, you know, I was kind of looking at their schedule and I didn't think that they had really played anybody as tough as, you know, as UNC had. So I mm -hmm. thought that UNC might have the edge there just because they had played a little bit of a tougher schedule. But, you know, Jeff Wallace is a great coach and right. it's pretty much a whole new roster, you know, from what he had last year with you know, Olivia Cochran and a couple other players as the lone holdovers. Um, but, you know, he's got them playing well together. They're going to be a tournament team for sure. And, you know, as the ACC schedule progresses, I think this past week kind of proved that anybody can beat anybody. You know, we saw Virginia, you know, win at Florida State yesterday. Right. Um, so, yeah, the conference race is definitely not over. No, no doubt about it. I mean, you've got, as we said, you've got three teams with one loss. And I get to a certain point in conference play, and I always kind of I, I get more into the conference only statistics because I think that that's more relative of where teams are because that's that's the <clears> life that they're living at the moment. We can put their non con and stuff out kind of to pasture. So if I pull conference stats for the ACC, as you mentioned, Elizabeth us Alyssa Usby from North Carolina, she's the top rebounder in this league, along with Elizabeth Kitley from Virginia Tech. And you mentioned Deja Fair from from Syracuse, she's averaging almost 23 points a game. So that type of scoring and being assertive in multiple ways, you see why these teams are able to do it. Louisville holding teams to just 61 points a game with their defense. Now they couldn't get it done yesterday against North Carolina, but it seemed as though it was a little bit slow start for Louisville, quick start for North Carolina to start both first, both halves. And that maybe was what separated them the most. Yeah, I think so. And, um, you know, I think the one thing that Louisville is kind of missing this year is like they don't have um, sort of that that star like go to player. It's it's mm -hmm. a lot of really good players yes. and they play together and they play well. But, you know, kind of like when the chips are down and things get tight, you know, yesterday, North Carolina went to Deja Kelly um, and she hit, you know, a career high 14 free throws and and really knocked them down, you know, down the stretch when when things mattered. Um, Louisville doesn't really have like that, you know, go to go get me a bucket, you know, kind of player like they've had in the past with the Haley Van Lifts and the and the Dana Evanses of the world um, and even the Emily Inksters, you know, who can okay. get you a stop on defense. Um, so I think that's maybe the one thing that they're missing. But, you know, that player could emerge, you know, over the next month and a half for sure. Yeah, there's a lot of time left to be played. All right, let's talk a little bit about Notre Dame um, because I've always been, as you know, I've always said I'm, I'm bullish on where I think this lineup has been, what they've done, and they've managed. They've managed their own fair share of injuries that have come and gone, but it has been absolutely the breakout season of a freshman point guard and Hannah Hidalgo. She's second right now in conference games and scoring almost over 24 points a game. You've seen the Irish in person. Tell me a little bit about this squad. They're five and two right now in conference play, 14 and three overall. 
Yeah, I mean, their biggest thing was like they needed to get healthy. Um, I yeah. saw them, you know, lose at home to North Carolina, and that was a game where they got Sonia Citron back, but Maddie Westbelt was sidelined um, with concussion symptoms. Um, you know, yesterday they they win pretty easily over Wake Forest, and they had, you know, their full for now. You know, Olivia Miles is still out, but right. you know, as sort of the season has gone, their full sort of complement of players with mm-hmm. Hildago, Citron, um, you know, Anna DeWolf, Maddie Westbelt, Kylie Watson, KK Bransford, uh, Natalia Marshall. So, um, you know, yeah, and Hildago has been really, really great. Um, I I'm. Sort of, you know, the uh, the rest of the ACC would be pretty scared, I think, to think about what this Notre Dame would look like if they had Olivia Miles yeah. plus Anna Hildago plus Sonia Citron. Um, uh-huh. You know, as it is right now, though, Hildago, I think, is far and away, um, you know, the favorite to win ACC Rookie of the Year. Uh-huh. Um, I think you can make a case, you know, you can make an argument she could challenge Juju Watkins for National Freshman of the Year. Yeah. Um, she's been really, really great. And on both ends of the floor, too, I, I think she leads the nation in steals per game still. Uh-huh. Um, so she can impact that game that way. And, you know, like you mentioned, averaging north of 20 points per game. So, you know, now that they're healthy, I think that you're going to see Notre Dame sort of start to climb the standings again and and get back in this ACC race. All right. We're going to talk a little bit more about that race. We're going to talk about the reigning ACC champs from the tournament, and they were in the Final Four. We're going to talk about Virginia Tech when we come back. And an old-time winning coach in college basketball is now in the women's ranks. Well, this show today is sponsored by BetterHelp. Around New Year's, we get obsessed with how to change ourselves instead of just expanding on what we might already do and already know is right. And maybe you finally organized one part of your space, but you want to tackle the other. So therapy helps you find your strengths so you can ditch the extreme resolutions and make changes that really stick. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. So celebrate the progress that you have already made in a very short 2024. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on MBA today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H E L P dot com slash locked on NBA. And we also know that the NFL regular season is wrapped up, but there is still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. It is playoff time, folks. And if you haven't heard, we are just a few weeks from the Super Bowl. So right now, new customers get 150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's 150 bucks in bonus bets win or lose. The app is so easy to use and there are so many different ways to bet like live same gay parlays, find bets in the new explore tab. You can make a parlay in the parlay hub, the best way to find popular parlays and more. So visit fanduel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup. Fanduel, the official partner of the NFL. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I am Missy Heydrich, and thank you for joining us here on Locked On Women's Basketball. All right, Mitchell Northam, we've been talking about this ACC, and we would be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about Virginia Tech. This is still a squad. They are ranked in the AP Top 25. They come in this week. I believe they're sitting somewhere in the – they're sitting at number 19, still in the top 20. They themselves have taken their lumps. You know, this is a group they're 14-4 and on the season – uh, they sit at five and two in the ACC in conference play, but they've got the leading scorer in the ACC. She's the reigning and uh, player of the year in the league. Talk a little bit about maybe just the ups and downs of this Virginia Tech team, and maybe what what does the next few weeks look like for them? And what do you, as someone who's is in this league in a day in day out, what do you think you got to see from Virginia Tech if they're going to get themselves back to where they were a year ago? Yeah, um, you know, they, they had two losses recently, you know, lost at Florida State, which is a tough place to win. Um, you know, again, Virginia just went down there yesterday and won, which was really surprising. Um, but, you know, Florida State's a good team this year, and, um, so, you know, that was a tough loss for, for Virginia Tech. But then they also lost at Duke. And really, I mean, the thing about that loss was, you know, they lost Georgia Amor um, in the middle of that game. She went down, diving on the floor. 
um, and I think is experiencing some concussion symptoms. Um, she did not play yesterday when they won over Clemson. Um, so that's kind of the thing I'm watching right now is, you know, the good thing for Virginia Tech is like it's a little bit of a soft spot in their schedule, you know, coming up. They're going to play um, Georgia Tech at home this Thursday. But then on Sunday, they've got to travel to Syracuse, and that's going to be a tough game. So right. if they can get Georgia Amor back for that Syracuse game, that'll be good for them. Um, but I think, you know, this, you know, the kind of ups and downs that they've had, you know, they had that really big win at home over NC State and at NC State, their first loss of the season on a, you know, last second turnaround bucket by Elizabeth Kitley, who's, you know, playing, been consistent and playing really well, you know, as good as any other player in this league. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, you know, as I look at sort of the rest of the roster, I think it's a group that is still trying to find themselves a little bit. You know, last year was a really tight group. Um, they did have to replace two starters, you know, Kayana Trailer and Taylor Soul moving on. Uh, got some time in the WNBA in the offseason. So, yeah, I think they're still working in some new pieces, trying to figure out everybody's role outside of that Kitley, Amor, Kayla King part of it. You know, they know what those three players bring to the floor. How does the other pieces of the roster kind of fit in? So, um, you know, last year right around this time, um, and again, it was a loss to Duke. You know, they lost at Duke, and then they went on that run of yes. you know, 16 or so wins in a row all the way to the Final Four. So I, I kind of wonder if maybe, you know, once Georgia Amor gets healthy, um, if this will be, if we'll see Virginia Tech kind of go on another run. Now they are in this pod system, um, you know, I think and this is the last year of it in the ACC because next year we're adding Stanford, Cal, and SMU. Right. So the schedule is going to change a little bit. But in this pod system that they're in, you know, they still have to play North Carolina twice and they still have to play NC State twice. They have to play Duke once more. Um, so that's all coming up in this, you know, rest of January, February um, for them. So some tough games ahead. Um, we'll see if they can figure it out. Uh, you're absolutely right. It's a grind. I mean, any conference schedule, I think right now in these upper level leagues is a complete and utter grind because you got to play multiple people multiple times and you got to figure out a way to hold home court and you got to steal a few on the road. And these are not easy places to play. I think we'd also be remiss if we don't mention the Wolfpack in at number seven this week in the just released AP poll. Um, your thoughts, you know, when we talked in the preseason and kind of previewing the ACC the questions about what NC State could do were just solely just because it was such a young team of so many new faces for Westmore. They figured it out, and they figured it out quick. Can this group sustain where they've been, knowing what lies ahead with their schedule? We're only in mid-January right now. Yeah, I mean, they're you know when they're at their best, um, you know, yesterday against Duke, they they won by twenty at home. Um, but, you know, we, we've seen them slip up a little bit this year, too. You know, just last week they lost on the road at Miami. Right. Um, and, you know, Miami is another team, you know, that's kind of in the middle of the pack there in the ACC. But, you know, when they're at their best, they can they can beat, you know, some of the top teams, too. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I mean, when when Isaiah James and Sanaya Rivers and Zoe Brooks and Mimi Collins and Madison Hayes are kind of all going at, you know, the same level and they can get up and run and, you know, just run people out of the gym. The other thing for NC State is, you know, they've been without River Baldwin for the past couple of games, who has really yeah. kind of emerged this year as, as a really good center in the ACC and, and has had some good games and has kind of been a good rim protector and rebounder for, for the Wolfpack. Um, she had missed a couple of games with an ankle injury. She came back yesterday against Duke and, and played a few minutes and started. Um, so that's going to be good for them moving forward. So. Yeah, um, I think it's just consistency. You know, I, that game against Miami, they just didn't shoot well, and Miami just locked them down on defense. So, you know, you're going to have nights like that. And um, I think that, you know, going forward, it's the ACC is really going to be interesting in February when you have those, you know, UNC, NC State twice, UNC, yes. Virginia Tech twice, Virginia Tech, NC State twice. I mean, I think we're going to see a lot of movement there. Um, at, at the top of the conference, or we might see a team, you know, like Virginia Tech did last year and just kind of so roll through and ascend to the top. So um, yeah. we'll see. Well, they're the next round of games in the ACC, January 25th, and then there's a host, there's a handful on the 27th and a handful on the 28th. Anything that you circle coming up this week that people should keep their eyes on? 
Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, Notre Dame's next two games are, are pretty big. You know, they're going to play Syracuse. Syracuse beat them earlier this season, mm-hmm. so this is kind of the the rubber match of that game. And then Notre Dame, ha- you know, sneaks in a non-conference game on Saturday. Yes. They're going to play UConn um, at UConn, which is, you know, kind of a rekindling of an old Big East rivalry um, when Notre Dame was in that league. So that's going to be a good game. I think that's 8 o'clock on Saturday night. Um, and then you look at Sunday, you know, Virginia Tech's going to play Syracuse. And, um, uh, yeah, I think that's that's probably the big one, Virginia Tech-Syracuse. Yeah. So so big week for the Orange, you know. And <laughs> All around. Two more, two more ranked teams. So we'll see. <laughs> No, I'm with you. And I think that I think the Notre Dame UConn game will be incredibly interesting because, as you said, I think this is finally, um, you know, Neil Ivy's finally looking around going, oh, my gosh, I have pretty much all the pieces that I thought I would have available. And UConn has been decimated, but yet continues to win and has one of the longest winning streaks in the country. And so you're right. I think kind of that bol- that old Big East flavor and it could be a really interesting matchup. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun, I think. Um, yeah, and as you mentioned, you know, both of these teams, you know, battled a ton of injuries. Um, yes. And, uh, yeah, so to see sort of like what they expected, you know, sort of to be healthy, um, you know, Paige Becker's going against Sonia Citron and the whole thing, I, I think it'll be a lot of fun. No, I'm with you. All right, before I let Mitchell go, I have to ask him because yesterday was a monumental day in the world of women's basketball. Uh, Tara Vanderveer at Stanford becomes the all-time winningest coach in college basketball, 1,203 victories, uh, celebration um, of all things. And ironically, I thought it was fitting. She did it against a Pac-12 team. They get a 65-56 win over Oregon State. They were without Cameron Brink. Mitchell, you've been around this game a long time. You've been covering it. You're a voter in the AP poll. You see what happens on a, a daily and weekly basis. But just the impact and and from someone who's on the East Coast, but yet you see all of it moving across the country. Um, this is something that just doesn't happen very often. And crazy as it is, we are on the verge of seeing this record broken twice this season, I think, which would be incredibly strange. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, Gino is, is right there behind Tara, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a really, I mean, tremendous accomplishment for for Tara Vanderveer and, and awesome to have, you know, sort of on on our side of the sport here on the women's game. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's funny, Saturday night, I covered a Duke men's game. Um, they played Pitt and I was freelancing that game for the AP and, you know, look up in the rafters and, uh, you know, there's a banner for Coach K for yeah. the all-time wins leader. I was like, huh, they might have to change that, um, you know, or add <laughs> men's to it, yeah. you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I thought, you know, that that was interesting, you know, just to sort of think about on on Saturday night. But, yeah, it's, um, you know, I think when you talk about the Mount Rushmore of of coaches and, and women's basketball or just basketball, I think mm-hmm. I think you have to put Tara on there. You have to make space for her for sure. Um, and she's somebody that, you know, um, it's kind of fitting, I think, that, she, you know, gets that record this year yes. and kind of what is the last year of the Pac-12 as we know it. Mm-hmm. Um, she's, you know, Stanford has been a top of that league, you know, for so long and kind of carried the banner for that league. I think I think she's won like 27 Pac-12 regular season titles or something yeah. crazy like that. So, um, yeah, certainly one of the best coaches in our game and and somebody who has had, I mean, impact i think on a lot of coaches mm-hmm. um across the country earlier this season someone asked courtney banghart about tara um after they played at uconn earlier this year in that hall of fame showcase thing and she was talking about how you know when she was you know kind of on her rise at princeton tara kind of gave her some advice about you know being selective and sort of um the next job she took if she were to leave princeton for something else um, so I, I think that's pretty interesting, you know, just sort of her mentorship of of sort of the next generation of coaches for sure. Um, so, yeah, it's it's an awesome accomplishment and awesome to see, you know, women's basketball get, get some shine for that. Oh, 100 percent. I'm with you there. And I think you're right. I said someone's going to have to get up in those rafters and they're going to have to do a little um, extra word addition to that one for mm-hmm. Coach K at Cameron, which is pretty darn cool to have that. But as you said, it, it's no longer that holds. Um, but Tar Vanderveer has transcended women's basketball in a host of ways. And I thought about this last night. I, you know, you think about that number, 1,203 that she has now. 
but that is with a, with a year that she took away to coach USA basketball for the Olympics. Right. So you take that out, she would have had this record probably a year and a half, maybe two years ago. You know, sure. and that's what's so crazy. Um, but yet, I speak speaks volumes for women's basketball and the people that have been part of it. And, you know, we're going to probably see this record broken again this season because Gino is really right on her heels with the numbers. It's crazy to think. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty wild. Yeah, so. absolutely. All uh, right. I'm interested to see kind of if, uh, you know, they sort of play this game, you know, they're both, they're both up there in age. Like does Gino wait for Tara to retire first? Does Tara, I know. <laughs> you know, how, how does that work? That's I know. Really it's very true. And I think that's one of the ultimate questions now, like in, and, you know, in this space that we're in with the lights being turned off in the PAC 12. And so fitting that she gets this record at home and that she breaks it and she beats a PAC 12 team. But, you know, are we in the discussion now to think that we may be looking at college basketball without Tara Vanderveer in it very soon, because sure. it does change. That landscape is so very different. Um, that, you know, who knows this, this could have been a catalyst, could have been a goal and a catalyst that none of us will know until she makes that decision. But I think it will have, it will have ripple effects and, and a huge impact. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. All right. Mitchell North and where does everybody find you, my friend? Yeah, I'm on uh, Twitter and Instagram uh, at primetime Mitch and you can read me at North Carolina public radio and USA today's for the win. Um, and every now and then at the next. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for giving us all of your knowledge and expertise. He is a voter. And so he owns that, I know, which I love about him. And also the man that knows all things about the ACC. So thank you so much for coming on today. Well, you can find me at Missy Hydric on X, formerly known as Twitter, or whatever we want to call it. Also go and follow this podcast at Locked on WBB so you can see all of my amazing colleagues there as well as get over to the next at the next Well, thank you for making Locked on Women's Basketball your first listen every day. Locked on has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked on Sports Today is here for you 24-7 covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On plus our national shows covering every league. So go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. Stay warm, everybody, wherever you are. Happy Monday and have a fantastic week.